Well, hey, welcome everybody today, and thanks for, for, for dialing in. Um, as I said earlier, <clears throat> I can talk a lot about the Food Safety Modernization Act, or FISMA, in true form of the food industry. We like to put everything into an acronym. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm going to walk through. This is a very large, uh, obviously, uh, uh, pending regulation in the, in the U.S. Uh, we have a short period of time today, so this is just a top-level uh, overview of, of the various uh, aspects of the Act and, and how it is being uh, uh, formed into regulation so you can get the bits and pieces of the different regulation that stems from the Act and hopefully try to you know tease out of there the, those that are more uh, are, that are pertinent to your operation or your line of business that you that you might be in. So that's a picture of me. You've seen me already, uh, and uh, basically, what uh, you know, I, I, I run the consulting and technical services for NSF International, mostly here in North America. But I've got colleagues uh, a, a across the world, and, and uh, that that are also involved in in a number of different aspects. And obviously, FISMA because it uh, is going to affect both domestic uh, uh, producers and, and manufacturers in in uh, in the U.S. Uh, but equally will it be affecting um, anybody that's exporting food to the U.S. Um, because those particular regulations will also be applying to those. So wherever you are in the world, um, uh, this will have an impact on you. Uh, and again, depending on where you are with your food safety management system, it may be a, a, a lot of extra things you might want to do or maybe not. Um, that depends on uh, the, the, the maturity of your systems and, and how robust they are. Uh, just a little bit about NSF International, just a, a, a screenshot from our webpage. Um, we're a public health and safety organization uh, with headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We've got centers of excellence uh, here in Canada where, where I work out of. We've got uh, centers of excellence in our UK office and offices in Thailand uh, and in uh, Peru and other parts of Latin America. So very global in reach. <coughs> uh, in food safety, we we do uh, we are a certification body across the all the um, from farm to fork, so to speak, with, from global gap up to different aspects of uh, trans, uh, distribution. Uh, we've got a large training and, and education um, arm that uh, takes a lot of these. We've got FISMA courses already ready to go um, in various parts of the world. So uh, well positioned to to help and assist with understanding the FISMA and um, what it means. So here's, a, uh, here's, here's our agenda for the day, or for the for the day, for the hour anyways. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about FISMA and, and its need. Not a lot, just to give you a framework of this. And some of you may have already participated in various FISMA courses, or, or and this may be a, a um, an update for you. For others, it's brand new. So we're trying to accommodate a number of different needs here uh, in terms of those that have dialed in today. Um, we're going to break it just again front end around FISMA and what its need is and then go into the, the key, key themes or pillars of FISMA around uh, the prevention, uh, preventive controls, the inspection piece around what FDA and the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. is going to be doing around there. Uh, for many of you that are exporting the import safety and how the uh, importers in the U.S. will be working with uh, external uh, manufacturers around the world. And then uh, a little bit around enhanced partnerships and and how uh, FDA is looking to to bridge across different uh, partners to 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 make this work. And as we go through the presentation, talk a little bit about how it might uh, affect your business and, and and finish up with around eligibility and whether you need to be concerned about it based on size of your operation or whatever sector uh, you might be uh, be going. And then the end, uh, Simon indicated, we'll we'll wrap up with uh, if you've got questions that you can input into the chat, uh, we'll take them up um, at the end as much as we can with time, time. And if we don't have time to finish up, we'll uh, we'll collate some responses to them and get get them um, available to you as well. Okay, so the Food Safety Modernization Act. If you're not too familiar with with U.S. regulation. It's Congress, the U.S. Congress uh, creates an act which says, which has a whole bunch of stuff in it, <laughs> uh, but it's not regulation because the, the regulations are developed by the, the Food and Drug Administration. So, so what the act did was it, uh, it, uh, it was very expansive, a very large change in terms of what regulation they, they had on the books prior to 2011. 
And um, it, it focuses on a number of things that we're going to go through. It focuses on, on prevention and, rather than reaction. So rather than being a reactionary uh, thing where FDA would come in and inspect the plant or either at home or abroad and, you know, tell you you're doing a bunch of things wrong and then you got to fix it. It's all meant to, in a true form of a passive and hazard analysis and critical control points and food safety management systems, it is meant to be more uh, prevention and, and ensure that the, the various risks and hazards within a facility are being, uh, are known and that we've got good preventative controls around there. Um, it does put a little more meat and potatoes, so to speak, around enforcement and, and, and how FDA will, will enforce those, those regulations. And, and uh, it really also expands into imported foods because more and more of the, the foods that are brought into the U.S. are being imported. So extending the regulations from a domestic perspective out into the, uh, into the uh, export community. Okay, so a little bit again. What was the what was the need for uh, for FISMA where it comes? Well, relatively speaking, consumers in North America and Europe and in some of the more uh, developed countries are fairly confident uh, around the food that they produce. Uh, but we do know that there are still lots of instances where people are getting sick from eating contaminated product or uh, product with various hazards in them. Um, these are uh, U.S. statistics, uh, and, they, and they do a very good job uh, through the uh, through various mechanisms of collecting this uh, and, uh, and and making these types of statistics known. Approximately, you know, 48 million people get sick annually, 120, 130,000 hospitalized, and a very uh, sobering fact: where still still 3,000 people are dying from foodborne illness, and um, uh, still. You know, relatively large numbers. So, so, so FDA's uh, um, regulations are are basically to establish science-based, which we all, as food safety practitioners, like food safety to be in the realm of science. Um, although we do know that there's uh, sometimes um, uh, instances that crop up that's not science-based. But if it's done in pro cor correctly and properly, the science uh, and science-based and a flexible system that can accommodate for various processes and types of products, then we'll we'll get it right. And there has been a lot of advances over the last uh, you know last you know 15 to 20 years that I've been working in, in over 30 years in the food industry in terms of recognition of those hazards and food safety systems and very good preventative controls. So this. Uh, the regulations are meant to uh, to basically reduce those statistics and and, uh, and improve public health overall. Um, so, but as the you know as the regulation changes, so has the the food industry. Um, you know, globalization has increased uh, the need for imports. So, um, uh, approximately now, 15% of the food that comes into the U.S. is imported. Um, there, that involves uh, of those over 300,000 food facilities worldwide uh, contribute to that 15% uh, import figure, uh, with some uh, some commodities and some food groups such as seafood and and fruits and vegetables um, contributing more to that 15% than others. And we'll talk a little bit more about those statistics a little bit later. Um, the supply chain has also got increasingly complex, uh, as we all know it. Uh, some of the recalls that have occurred globally have have really um, put a lot of focus on that. So, so as those supply chains uh, get more complicated, so so too do the possible risks and hazards that um, that are associated with all the different handshaking and movement of products uh, globally. Uh, new emerging hazards. It's a very dynamic uh, environment in which we uh, uh, work in in the food industry and the manufacturing that occurs. Hazards are always uh, changing. We sometimes get unexpected uh, pathogens and hazards in foods that we typically wouldn't have associated. So for instance, uh, you know, salmonella and nuts and tea. Well, years ago, um, wasn't an issue. Didn't mean it wasn't there, but it uh, wasn't it either as prevalent or um, or we hadn't seen it. So, so those uh, those things can affect um, and, and the need for better preventative controls all the way through the system. Demographics are also changing. So, and we see this a lot with 
in various uh, countries with, with allergens. Some We have a lot of different allergen lists in countries because the demographics even within a country uh, and, and the, um, the issues around that can, can change uh, tremendously. So as the population grows and more, uh, more uh, individuals at, are at risk to different foodborne illnesses, uh, that has also uh, spurred the need for uh, better preventative controls and more consistency around that globally. The media and the use of media, especially social media, um, has really put a, a microscope on issues as they occur. It's it's not uncommon for a foodborne illness outbreak to to go global and viral within an hour hours of a, of an occurrence, uh, just because of the way that people can communicate now. So so the need to understand the media, understand social media, and how it affects. Both the way to communicate, which is which is good, we can get our messaging out better. But it's also how do we, as we uh, develop our food safety management systems, incorporate social media and understand that both in terms of how we use it as food manufacturers, but also how the regulators will use it to 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 communicate and use it to uh, to uh, oversee any instances that would be occurring. And then, uh, obviously, with the recalls, they do occur. We all know they occur. Um, they all cost a lot of money. Uh, we don't like them, but they are. So, how do we, when they do occur, um, how do we work with regulators? How do we work with the media? How do we work with our customers to to minimize the impact of those and um, and get uh, suspected or um, um, contaminated product off the market as, as soon as possible? So, all those things. Are happening and have been happening, and it spurred the need for uh, for FISMA and uh, and um, and the regulations that have that have come about because of that. Talked a little bit about uh, new uh, pathogens and different things. There's a basic list of some of the the different types of outbreaks that have been linked to various uh, illnesses over the last um, number of years. Some more concentrated in the U.S., but uh, you know also. Um, have seen a lot in other uh, different t parts of the U.S., uh, Europe, and um, other parts of the world, where where just different commodities, uh, different illnesses, different types of pathogens have been occurring and and continue to occur. So we all learn from them all the time when they when they happen. Uh, but again, if we can be preventative in nature and and try to think of these things before they occur within any particular process that we're manufacturing or transporting food, then uh, we can stay a, a ahead of the curve, so to speak. Okay, so who's affected by, by FISM? It's, it's a very uh, broad act with a number of different, uh, as I said, regulations that uh, we're going to, uh, to review here. Primarily uh, uh, looking at, obviously, manufacturers and processors of, 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 of product. In, in any number of different sectors. It doesn't affect uh, current uh, sectors that are currently regulated by the USDA, mostly, <coughs> excuse me, uh, meat and poultry. So a lot of the other ones uh, fall into the purvey of the of FDA and, and would um, be affected by that. It does also go to uh, farmers and growers. Um, so there is a, a produce, produce food safety rule that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and that's relatively new, and, and, and they're trying to be fair about, you know, who it might apply to and, and who not. So there's a, there are some exemptions in there as we try to, to, to uh, stream down and target who those regulations should apply to as it relates to controlling uh, hazards that are likely to occur in those particular types of commodities. It does also involve transporters, so there's a, there's a transportation rule that they that had been on the books before 2011, and they brought it forward and now included it into uh, into FISMA. Retailers and importers, because many retailers are importers, so the importers is a uh, is a sector that hadn't been under regulation before, but now will be because of the of uh, the uh, role they play in uh, bringing food into the U.S. Um, obviously, laboratories, third-party certification bodies, uh, as they look to um, provide some uh, additional oversight to the supply chains. Uh, we've all seen so these might be uh, GFSI types of uh, recognized standards and their certification of them. So, how do they play into um, into FISMA? We'll talk a little bit about that later um, 
in how FDA is 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 going to or potentially going to be using some of those so that we can remove some duplication and uh, and streamline some of those processes. Uh, and then obviously other foreign governments as the FDA looks to establish some um, uh, state relationships uh, and partnerships with various governments uh, uh, around the world to help with the, the oversight of this regulation. So I said earlier, um, the key themes and concepts are kind of like like pillars. So we have the 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 act, and then within the act, we have these these pillars with them. So we're going to go through those those pillars in a little more detail. It's just a, an overview uh, slide here to, to show you um, prevention is is probably the uh, the one that affects um, uh, uh, anybody producing food. Um, that's where we talk about preventive controls, uh, hazard analysis, all the different monitoring and verification activities around prevention and, and records associated with that. So we'll talk a little bit more detail of that. The pillar on inspections and compliance is around the tools and the different ways that FDA will uh, look at uh, 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 creating more frequent and targeted inspections. Um, it's impossible for them, given the, the mandate, to inspect every facility, uh, both domestically and uh, and obviously um, external to them. Um, so they're looking for way, they're looking for mechanisms to uh, to improve on that. Frequency with by, by various outreach and enhanced partnerships, which you see as a as a pillar over to the right. And that third pillar um, is the around import safety. So, how do we establish good preventative controls on on, on product that is being exported to the U.S.? So we'll talk about that particular regulation as well. So start with prevention. Um, so what the, the regulations uh, have done, and we'll talk, uh, you know, in a couple slides about that specific regulation, is uh, provide for uh, mandatory. In, in this case, uh, mandatory is a, is a new rule because some of it wasn't mandatory in all sectors. It is now uh, preventative controls for for uh, for food safety. The FDA already had mandatory controls for various sectors such as juices, seafood, and shell eggs. That has been expanded to to all the other sectors. Um, so mandatory controls include what you're doing. It also uh, requires uh, pre uh, written preventative controls. And when they talk about written preventative controls, we would typically associate that with, you know, a written HACCP program or a HACCP plan. So you may have heard that terminology or very or be very familiar with with HACCP. Um, so rather than just use and say HACCP. Uh, they're broadening it to more preventive controls, and they're uh, looking at HACCP as more hazard analysis and risk-based preventative controls, or what they call HARP-C. So very, very similar to HACCP and Codex HACCP, um, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the different nuances that you, you might want to familiarize yourself with in terms of understanding that piece around preventative controls. Um, so there's for food for the, so they have a regulation for food and for feed. Uh, there's a specific regulation for uh, for produce because produce obviously and, and the the, um, the production of produce is different than manufacturing products. There are different risks and hazards, so they've put some more uh, caveats around that. Um, if you're in that particular industry sector, you if you're familiar with good agricultural practices around fruits and vegetables, um, it speaks to to those types of uh, those types of controls that are required there. Um, they do talk about international int int intentional adulteration, so this would be like around uh, food defense and food fraud and those types of adulteration uh, that could occur in industry and then what are some of the risks around there and how you, you mitigate that. So a good food defense plan, um, a food security program is, is what that's talking about. And then I mentioned earlier the transport safety, so um, some requirements around uh, various modes of transportation and the expectation around maintaining the integrity and safety of products as we move them from one part of the supply chain to another. Okay, so preventative control approach. This uh, this approach, this diagram may not be uh, too uh, uh, dissimilar to, to to many of you. Um, whilst it, to, it is a five-step approach that FDA is showing here. It's not much different than you know the the 12 steps of, of Codex in, in developing a, a HACCP plan, 
where you start with your hazard analysis. Um, uh, what is the hazard and then what is it caused by because if until you know what it's caused by then you can't obviously imp implement preventive controls to reduce that cause or, or eliminate that cause from occurring. So we look at one, two, three, that's very much part of that hazard analysis, what's the cause, uh, how do we want to control that, whether uh, through a, a preventive control program that we're going to talk a little bit about some of that verbiage that FDA has, has used. Uh, you might be more uh, used to terms like prerequisite programs or GMPs, all kind of similar around controls. But those controls also include um, critical control points that would be part of a HACCP plan and also what we're introducing now through uh, hazard, hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls is a, is a preventive control point. So it might not be a CCP, but it also be, it might be a point in your process that you want to control a little bit more precisely than you would with broad-based uh, prerequisite programs or GMPs. With any controls, we, we, we have the monitoring effectiveness, monitoring corrective action, verification, very similar to the, uh, to the uh, HACCP principles. We apply that to both programs and uh, both obviously critical control points as well as preventative control points. And then the whole review and adjust process. Um, the review could be the validation of the programs, various verification activities, and then uh, a very prescriptive process, which obviously uh, Codex has has um, done for many years as well. How do we bring that back and, and stay current with the changes that happen within our our particular um, uh, facility or establishments? And, and then bring it back around and continually um, look at those types of risks. So, so that's what that preventive control approach is all about. So let's, uh, let's look a little bit at some of the um, uh, standards. So when I, you'll see on this slide here, Section 103 is the section of the, of the, the Act, and the regulation that um, FDA has created is, is uh, um, regulations around human and animal foods. So they're separate, but they're very similar. So that's why we kind of lump them together for the purposes of the presentation. Um, and they are uh, meant to, uh, to, again, as I mentioned earlier, look at evaluating your hazards and, um, and then putting preventive controls to prevent them monitoring and, and good verification activities. So we'll talk a little bit about, more about those controls. One of the things that's changed in um, in the in the last since the regulations have been formulated and, and back out to industry for input and back in it is is what is a hazard that you need to to take, take a look at within your facility. So so where they where they typically started with hazards that are reasonably likely to occur. Well, there's a lot of different hazards that are reasonably likely to occur within a facility, but they do they all have to be documented. So that seemed to be a very uh, large undertaking to look at every particular hazard that could likely occur rather than maybe severity. So, so they changed that to let's say, well, let's take a look at hazards that are, that are significant within our processes and make sure we have preventative controls around that. So maybe it's a balancing act between, you know, documenting every hazard that could likely occur, and some of them are really could be, you know, more far-fetched but still likely. Um, versus those that are significant and and those ones that we need to concentrate on in terms of those preventive controls, monitoring, and, and verification activities. So, um, so those are you know those those are the things that we're going to be discussing. Um, so when you're looking at compliance with with these prevention standards, so I'm looking at preventive controls. Um, this is a list of 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 uh, FDA's what they call preventative control programs. It may be a little bit different than what you, depending on 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 where you where you live, whether you're in Europe or other parts of the world or Canada or the U.S. There's many different ways to slice and dice uh, preventative controls. Like I said earlier, we can call them prerequisite programs. We can call them GMPs, um, but they're all looking at basically the same types of, and they're program based. So these are programs that we we monitor. On a regular basis, they 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 cover all of our processes. These are parts of our process. Obviously, sanitation is something we do across you know throughout our facilities. Uh, we do training uh, for employees and supervisors on food safety. Um, they've got some very specific areas around environmental controls and monitoring because 
with some particular um, sectors and food food types. This obviously is a is a growing concern. Again, this might have been embedded in various pieces of your programs before. Um, food allergens and food aller and allergy control programs uh, have been part of industry for some time. They've put obviously some some more caveats around that. Recalls always been there. Good manufacturing practices. Again, you might have them broken down into more specifics, uh, say around more equipment and and premises and transportation storage. Um, personal hygiene, those are all kind of bundled into that GMP space. And the other piece that that if you're if you're familiar with the GFSI recognized standards or other types of uh, advanced food safety management systems, they have supplier controls. So so no different here. So a supplier verification or a supplier approval program, an oversight program, uh, so that it, if you're manufacturing product that you um, you you have an idea of, of the types of risks and hazards coming in and, and, and how you're monitoring your particular suppliers. The uh, produce standard, uh, the standards for produce uh, safety are section 105. Um, and again, this is a little bit different than, um, than in manufacturing of, of foods and, and, uh, and animal feed because it's, it's a different process. Um, so what FDA has done is uh, obviously we've had a number of outbreaks in the in the produce space over the last last number of years. Um, it's a very difficult <clears throat> type of environment to control because a lot of times it's in a field. Yes, we have some greenhouse crops where you can control the environment. Well, when you're in a field, there's a number of different things that are going on, and through various outbreaks, we've learned a lot about um, where those hazards might might occur and then how they might stay around within within uh, the product as it moves from the field to either you know some minimally processed to the uh, uh, manufacturing to the consumer or not at all it's just you know sometimes we we pick and we pack and then we ship right from the field and it goes right to the grocery store so wherever you are in the world so so they put some caveats around looking at uh, water and agricultural water uh, the type of testing that we required there um, Biological soil amendments. So this is basically manures and and different types of composting that might be used, and, and some caveats around um, the concerns around that, and and when you can apply it, when you can't apply it. Health and hygiene is of, of of workers is is important in a manufacturing facility. It's also important in uh, in the produce uh, area. Some more requirements around that. Uh, animals and growing areas, how do you control that so that it minimizes uh, pathogenic uh, hazards from getting into the product. Then around equipment, tools, and buildings. So, so again, if you're familiar with good agricultural practices, these are elements that have been within uh, various standards that are being applied globally. If you're looking at some of the, again, GFSI recognized schemes such as Global Gap and Canada Gap and and New Zealand Gap, those are, those types of agricultural practices are already embedded in those schemes, and they're not too dissimilar from what is uh, within the, uh, the the regulation here. Intentional adulteration, as I said um, earlier, uh, is more around uh, the the risks uh, around food defense. So they put some caveats in there. Uh, that would require certain uh, size operations to have done a um, what they're calling vulnerability assessments of how, how vulnerable is your particular operation to the ability to uh, intentionally adulterate the product. So these typically around a lot of bulk foods or types of foods that could get out into very widespread into the um, into the um, Environment. So this does apply to both domestic and foreign facilities. So it's it it, uh, it it will be something that industry will need to look at if they haven't already done so. It's not uh, a lot of these food defense and assessment requirements are are already built into a number of of standards, including the GFSI recognized standards. Um, um, so you might hear uh, terms like so similar to HACCP, So that's hazard analysis critical control points. You might also hear words, uh, acronyms like VASIP and TASIP, which are kind of starting to get some some pickup in the uh, in the industry. We, like I said earlier, we like our acronyms, so they seem to to um, to sprout up at various points in time. So VASIP standing for vulnerability assessment, and any particular critical control points with, that might be linked to um, 
the vulnerability of, of your of your system and TASIP, which is threat analysis. Um, so typically, the threat analysis uh, is linked more to food defense. The vulnerability analysis is linked more to food fraud and obviously a lot of different um, uh, uh, communication and uh, things happening in the food fraud space as well. So starting to introduce those concepts through um, through the regulations and um, really uh, focusing on more of the food defense plan, the things you can control within your facility around those those threats that, that might be pertinent to that. So section 111, as I said, is, is, is um, around the sanitary transportation of food. Um, this is again a, a, a older regulation that was developed earlier on but wasn't fully uh, implemented. They kind of dusted it off and brought it into the um, into, in, in, in within FISMA and uh, I don't think we can all recognize the importance of, of this particular piece. So you can do the best job you can at, at uh, preventing hazards from control from within your facility and then you put it on a truck and the temperature isn't there or it's dirty, it's got you know possible chemical cross-contamination issues. So it's a critical piece in the supply chain and this, this particular uh, regulation addresses that. Uh, and that is both for human and animal food that's traveling by either uh, motor like uh, trucking or rail or uh, um, shipping. Who's going to be doing it um, and, and how it's going to be done. I mean obviously with the, the numbers and the quantity of sites that need to be inspected it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a, a, a very much a cross-section of, of various uh, regulators that can do that as well as uh, you know private uh, third-party auditors as well. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the act, and one of the things that's interesting in the act is the act specifically said to the FDA, you must uh, look at mechanisms to, to approve and or uh, incorporate uh, third party auditors into the, as uh, use of inspection in, in this program. So, um, very broad term to use, but they are, they're mandated to do that and they have been reaching out and, and looking at ways to do that. It's still not exactly clear. How that would, uh, when that would be accepted, but uh, it is a piece of the piece of the puzzle. So, um, so they've got this whole inspection thing, the, the access to the records. So the act improves their ability to to actually go in and look at the records without uh, without having to get uh, more court approval and all those sorts of things. Um, it also talks about uh, testing of products by accredited laboratories. So for certain high risk products, we'll talk about high risk products a little bit later. Um, you, you're, you're going to have to shoot, show how you're using accredited facilities, um, mostly under 17,025 if you're familiar with that accreditation standard for laboratories to prove that it's a viable lab uh, that whose um, um, results can be um, can be trusted. So, you want to move on then, Simon? Um, so, so the response again uh, gives them better res better uh, um, overall um, oversight for mandatory recall so they can uh, before again it was it, the language and the regulation they had wasn't it didn't give them enough uh, very good powers about saying hey you, you get a problem here I'm forcing you to make a recall um, many other foreign um, countries did have that so now the FDA has that ability to do that um, there's other things around you know their how they can their how they can expand their detention uh, of products and, and holding of products, suspension of registrations, um, uh, improving their ability to, to, to trace and track um, systems uh, in a recall so that if, you know, if, if the uh, facility can't do that, uh, then they can come in and, uh, and take control of that. Um, and then um, also looking at additional record, record keeping for high risk foods. So, and and whole designation of high-risk foods, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, a, in a second. Okay, Simon, move ahead. <laughs> the that, that third pillar was, as I said before, import uh, import uh, safety. So much more accountability for importers. So importers will be those uh, uh, organizations within the borders of the U.S. that are responsible for bringing the product in. Uh, previous there there was le uh, regulation where you had to have a uh, you had to be registered or have somebody registered in the U.S. that was taking over um, uh, ownership of a product as it was coming into the U.S. 
So a lot of the stuff, we'll talk about that in a minute under what we call the Foreign Supplier Verification Program, which is basically putting the onus on that importer to know where that product is coming from and ensuring that it has the same uh, preventative control programs and systems in place as a domestic supplier. Um, also talk about third-party certification again, how we're going to use that um, and those auditors and, and certification bodies as a tool to ensure a product that's safe prior to coming into the U.S. Um, whole issue around certification high-risk foods, designation of high-risk foods and um, what further requirements are around high-risk foods. And we've got a couple slides around that uh, coming up. They, they've within the foreign supply verification program they have uh, what's called the voluntary qualified importer program it's it's a little behind in terms of the regulation but the premise behind that is it's almost like a you know an automatic you know you know go card to get into the US so if you if you, if you volunteer for it you can prove that you're you're you've got your controls in place you've got that on record uh, you're submitting those records. It's almost like, a, like I said, a, a, a get. You know, you, you you can get in relatively easy at the border, and your products can move very, very slow, smoothly into the U.S. system. So, and they also have an authority to deny entry at at various ports, uh, and improved authority around that. Okay, can move on, Simon. So, a couple slides again. What are high risk foods? And this is always a very common uh, product. I make this X product. You know, is it on the high risk uh, uh, food thing, food thing? So what FDA has gone is they've they've collected a number of different um, forms of, of risk analysis uh, to basically come up with a, a very um, more robust system and a fair system of what might be designated as a high risk food, and that could be a whole sector, it or it could be a very specific food. So some of the things they're considering around, you know, again. What's the history of it? Severity of different outbreaks. So does that get you? It may not have been a high risk food, but because of the history of it, it might it might get on that list. The high potential for risk and support of, of, of pathogenic microorganisms. Obviously, some food is is just formulated so that it's not an issue. Others more ready to eat products um, are uh, more prone to that. So those those would also fall into that category, high risk. And, uh, and and if there's a point in a process that maybe when you go again from say a raw to cooked, does that create uh, it to be high risk because the controls are needed in within the facility are very specific to um, to controlling that particular um, piece? Uh, move forward, Simon. So similar with that, so obviously they're, they're looking at the likelihood of contamination in, in steps within a process. So, so if there's a higher likelihood of contamination due to the manufacturing process, that might designate it as high risk. Um, uh, likelihood that consuming a particular food will result in food illness due to the contamination of the food. And um, just known severities of, of and health and economic impact. So a number of different variables that... Um, that FDA is considered to to uh, to doing that. They are looking at and will be publishing. And stay tuned to what that what that list is. It's it's there's some there now, but they'll be fine tuning that list as as the, we get closer to uh, to the regulations and uh, and the uh, the timing of the regulations being in, in place. So, okay, uh, next uh, is the uh, Simon. Can you move forward? Okay, so now we're looking at uh, what's called uh, the Foreign Supplier Verification Program. These are, again, requirements for an importer. So, so this gives the FDA the mandate to say, okay, as an importer, you've got to you've got to have control over an understanding of the products that, you, that are bringing into the U.S. and the risks and hazards of that. It's it's imperative to understand that there's going to be a much stronger relationship that will have to occur between the importer. And the person that's in the facility that's exporting into the U.S. very, you know, strongly recommend that you make sure that that relationship is very well known. The more complex the supply chain, the harder it is to do that. So if you manufacture a product, sometimes it can go through three or four different brokers and agents sometimes before it even gets to the U.S. for an importer. So it's going to be very important for the importer to understand that supply chain and at the point of manufacture and getting information around how that's being controlled. 
So if you if you move forward, uh, Simon. So the importer will have to develop and maintain a program for each food imported. Um, in the past, they saw themselves probably as, as the buyers and sellers. It's no longer just a, they are now responsible for uh, the safety of that product if they're bringing it in and they are actually uh, uh, distributed within the U.S. Um, so some of the requirements, they may vary on type of product. Yeah, as an importer, small, very small uh, importers. So there's different rules around uh, that. They didn't want to put a whole bunch of burden on on some importers uh, if, if it's not warranted. So it, later, near the end of the presentation, we've got a slide in terms of, uh, of how they've um, looked at eligibility around that. Um, but, uh, but a lot of emphasis on the types of hazards in the food and how it's being controlled. Um, so if you can move on, uh, Simon. Um, so, so compliance status, the review, um, they're going to have to be responsible, the importer will be responsible for um, their suppliers and whether they comply to the regulations of, of FISMA. So, so that, it's more of an oversight. So, so whilst they don't make the product, they do have to understand what the risks and hazards are. They won't do the hazard analysis on it. Obviously, the manufacturing facility do, but they'll have to have a record of that analysis They'll have to make sure it's up to date. They'll have to have other types of verification uh, activities around that, that particular supplier or exporter to the U.S. That may be saying, hey, send me your third-party audit reports. It may be, um, um, I'm going to actually get some of my product and do some testing here. So there's a lot of, um, it's not very prescribed. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in it. But regardless, they, the importer will be required to, to show how they have set up that verification program. They'll have to have records for that, and if something goes wrong, they'll have to have correct corrective actions, and they'll have to have a very specific periodic reassessment of their whole program. It's not saying it's annually. It, they may say for some of the suppliers it may be annually, some it may be at a more or less frequent basis, again, depending on risk. So, so and then um, identification at the entry of, of port, uh, they'll have to uh, deal with that as well. So documentation is a, is a big piece here, having food safety plans, um, use of a third party auditor and, and the certification and having that certificate of record could, could be part of it, maybe not be, um, but could be. And um, again, prior notice submission. Uh, so, so you can't just show up at a port of entry and say, hey, I'm bringing this product in. So, so really clear communication with at ports of entry, hey, I'm bringing this product in. Uh, here's the paperwork on it. Here's the importer, and uh, if that's not all in place, um, you could get uh, refusal into the into the country. So, um, a lot more onus on the on the importer for sure. Okay, can we move on, Simon? Um, I think you went backwards, didn't you? I'm sorry, just. Okay, yeah, and I'll go back to that um, import safety mandates yeah. uh, records. We talked about the records. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, um, can move to the next slide? So, question, or I mentioned earlier, the role of third-party uh, uh, certification programs. It will be a tool um, that can be used. Um, we, th we think it's going to be uh, much more prevalent in, in the VQIP, the voluntary program. So if you've got a, 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 a certification to a GFSI recognized standard and you're part of VQIP, again, that's part of having that on record with the importer. When, you, when, you, when your product gets into the, into the port of entry into the U.S., it's almost like a, you know, a get, in, get in automatically type of a card. Um, if you're a high-risk food or a food ca category, uh, then it, 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 you might have to be uh, have a certificate from a designated auditor or designated approved auditor by FDA. Now this auditor could be a a foreign, uh, the, you know, a regulatory authority or regulatory inspector in your country. Um, so so a little bit of of, of, of um, ambiguity still there with respect to how we're going to use third party audits and certification. But definitely going to be a piece of uh, definitely VQIP and 
with for high risk foods a little bit maybe a different take on that. Good. Okay, go next. So the last pillar was around uh, enhanced partnerships. And I got up uh, again this slide and then a couple of slides, uh, one or two slides on, on timelines, and we're and we're, can, we're we're done. We can wrap it up here for further questions. So I mentioned earlier around enhanced partnerships. This is where FDA has to reach out, and they do have to rely on other types of agencies to help them with the inspection because they really don't have the the budget or the people to do that. So they 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 have in the past and will continue to use a lot of state authorities and then we'll start to see more for domestic inspections obviously the use of the state and possibly municipal inspectors that can be authorized to do that starting to see a lot of activity again with different uh, foreign um, uh, foreign countries to to look at the harmonization of, of FDA and the ability to to use some of those uh, those types of uh, authorities in, in, in other areas so um, all with the, you know, looking at improving that capacity, um, looking at different, better ways to improve uh, foodborne illness surveillance. Uh, a lot of good systems already in the U.S. around, you know, the Center for Disease Control, and looking to to um, interact more closely with other types of surveillance systems in other parts of the world, so that we can, uh, if there is an outbreak, uh, we can get better and quicker information on that. Okay. Simon, next. Okay, this is a, a uh, if you're looking at some of the timelines. So we talked about the different rules. So there is a deadline for the final rule uh, that you'll see. Most of them, the major ones, are coming up in uh, the latter part, middle, the latter part of this year. Um, some like transport and food defense are are in middle of uh, later next year. So when there's a final ruling deadline, there is a uh, what they call a, a compliance period. And it varies depending on um, you know size of operation and and type of uh, and where you are. So you'll see in that chart, typically if you're a fairly large manufacturer, you got a, a one year from that deadline date for the most part. Uh, you got a year and a half if you're a very large importer to do that. Um, if you're a small or very small um, uh, operation, then you've got they're giving you, they're giving you a little more time. Um, and that that vary again depending on uh, like so we look at the produce safety one for instance uh, you can see that the compliance dates and the drop dead compliance dates for those are extended out much more so than on the uh, you know the manufacturing side uh, to the point of if if you're a very small produce pr produce supplier you get four years to do that go to the next slide Simon it gives a little bit of a of a definition of small and very small so small business is uh, they. They've did, and this really changed a lot from the first go around um, that uh, when FDA was looking at the regulations and um, so a very small business would be somebody with less than 500 employees or a small business would be a very small business is not tied to number of employees but um, revenue that's produced so you can see that if it's less than a million dollars for if you're a very small producer if you're less than half, less than one million dollars in sales for human food, 2.5 for animal feed. Um, if you're a uh, importer uh, and if you have less than $500,000 in sales, uh, you know, then you're a very small uh, importer. So, so looking at different types of uh, of eligibility, uh, and if so, if you're less than those thing, those types of uh, uh, things, then then your compliance timeline will will vary accordingly. Okay, so that's uh, that takes me to the end of my presentation. Sorry about that glitch there. So hopefully, we got the, the messaging across. Uh, Simon, I understand we got uh, some some questions that have been piling in. If you want to, yeah, yeah, that. I'll, I'll, I'll just finish um, with the. You, you can contact Frank at the email there on the screen or, or the website NSF there. And, and as I say, the slides will be shared later. So, yeah, um, let me just stop sharing. Then we can get onto the questions. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> we got through it. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much for that, Frank. It, it was a primer, as you said, but um, it did it did give me uh, just as as uh, an individual a good uh, overview because uh, I've heard a lot about it, but I don't know a, a great deal about it. So it's a good good primer. Yeah, it, like, like with any regulatory change, um, we always encourage uh, you know people to get information 
from a number of different sources. Uh, training is always encouraged, so we can take any one of those regulations and do a, you know, one or two day training specifically on it and roll your sleeves up on it. So that's that's always an option. We definitely encourage that for those that are trying to understand more and more of it. They, another thing I didn't mention is the FDA has has done a very good job of of of, of putting a lot of this stuff on their website. Good guidelines, um, a lot, very clear language. Because regulatory regulatory language can be very complicated sometimes, but they've done a good job of simplifying this with various types of of, uh, of output and communication on their website. So we encourage people to uh, to go there as well. Yeah. Uh, just a question uh, before we get on to the attendees' questions. Just one from me, Frank. Um, if a, over the last few years, there's been a huge drive towards GFSI certification, you know, to BRC, SQF, IFS, FSSC, etc. If a company's already got in place a, a, a cert certified system that's, you know, effective and efficient, how far are they away from complying with FSMA? Yeah, you know, generally speaking, if they've been on a certification program for a number of years, they're probably not about 90 percent there. I think the main uh, thing that we're seeing different is is perhaps in that definition of preventative control. So if you've got a HACCP plan in place and you've done your hazard analysis and you've said uh, most of your things are controlled by you know uh, prerequisite programs or GMPs, you might have one or two CCPs. There may be some points in your process that you might want to relook at and, and depending on how you might have documented Within your your decision tree, because the decision tree is re, is is a requirement within a a HASA plan, you you may want to go back and relook at whether you want to took and say maybe some of those points are are preventative control points rather than and then they, rather than having being controlled by programs, and if they are, you might want to put a little bit more uh, emphasis on how you control those sorts of things. So what we're seeing in here in the ministry is is relooking at that an analysis. We're looking at the de definition of, of a preventative control and the preventative control point, and some of the monitoring and, and corrective actions you might want to have on there, just so that if something happens at a point in your process that isn't controlled by a, a very specific CCP or is more, it maybe not controlled fully by a, by a prerequisite program, you might want to look at that. So, so we're kind of thinking, you know, that 85-90% rule, if your food defense plan isn't really up to speed, you might have to, to update that too. Um, so that's, that's typically what we, we uh, have been communicating to a lot of our clients and what we're seeing in industry right now. Okay. There's, there's a, quite a few comments about how, how you know, say maybe this should, we should do a specific webinar on, on that because um, you know. I'm sorry, on, on HACCP or HARP-C, or is that what Harp, you're saying? HARP-C, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. It is. Um, it is a new term uh, that uh, that's come out of this whole thing. Um, there are training programs and could be webinars, like you said, specifically on HARP-C. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, developing materials and and going through uh, you know a decision tree and trying to to construct it in a way that would really change. Change from HACCP to harp -C. Like I said earlier, more around preventive controls within within a process rather than uh, you know you not necessarily shouldn't affect your CCPs because they're probably you know would stay the same. Uh, but I think how you use how you take an, a hazard analysis and walk it through a decision tree to get to a point where you can say. Uh, yeah, that is a preventive control point within my process, and here's my thing. So, so there are some some tools that are out there now, some training programs, and would encourage everybody to look at at, at that and understanding the different difference between HACCP and HARP C. Mm. Did uh, just as a, a point of interest, did FDA work at all with GFSI to sort of align? The benchmark, you know, the GFSI benchmarking standard that um, all the standards have to work to. Did have they come to get converged on this or not? Yeah, I think that's where the third-party uh, certification thing. So early on in the process, lots of dialogue with various groups, certification bodies, scheme owners, with FDA as stuff was coming up. So yeah, they were, you know, they 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 weren't operating within a bubble on that. There was a lot of good outreach to various stakeholders. As they look to put this regulation in place, so that's why 
you know, when you, to my point earlier, you know, if you, you know, if, if you got a, a GFSI, you know, certificate, you, you're you're about ninety percent there. What I think the main piece there is if you're an, if you're a, um, uh, an export to the U.S., like I said earlier, that relationship and that understanding from your importer as to what you got, and what you don't got, I think that's a that's a key a key point for uh, manufacturers outside of the U.S. to consider. Uh, if you're domestic, again, um, you may be used to to either state or or, or FDA officials already being in there, um, and if you've got a good uh, you know program that's already been approved by uh, through a, a third party auditor, uh, you're well on your way to 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 um, meeting those regulations. Okay, thanks. Um, radioactive, radioactive uh, right. in FSMA. Um, where does that come into it? Yeah, so what they've in, they've introduced uh, radiological hazards. Typically, when we're doing hazard analysis, we're concerned with uh, biological, chemical, which also includes allergens and, and physical hazards. Uh, they've they've introduced radiological hazards. At one point, they said you know every HASA plan uh, needs to consider it. They're still saying that, but you don't just because you don't uh, uh, include it in there. Doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, it is or is not a hazard. So um, some products, it's just it's just not of of a concern. Um, I think there'll be more information out there in the uh, available for types of products that you should at least consider it as a hazard. Um, mostly in terms of uh, the type of ingredients you get it into, or if you've got a particular. Uh, type of technology in your process that you might want to consider that as well. I wouldn't uh, be overly concerned about it, other than it might be something you have to consider if you if your uh, product or process has has the uh, uh, the type of contamination that might be prevalent. Yeah. Um, question: What is the difference between import alert and import refusal? Import alert versus import refusal. So import import refusal would be um, again if your if your uh, your if your product is, is stopped at a port of entry for whatever reasons you might not give prior prior a notice that you're you're coming on you might not have an importer of record to do that um, they're still going to be doing inspections at port so they can still uh, you know uh, quarantine product if if they uh, if the inspection at port uh, is not satisfactory, so that's all that re uh, there. Uh, an alert. Um, uh, to be honest, I'm not. I don't want to say specifically what that would be an importer alert. I and just look at postulate that it would be um, maybe if there's a, been a um, particular outbreak or concern around a particular type of product, they might put an alert out um, so that um, they might increase their inspections at port of entry for that that type of commodity. Okay. Um, just a couple more, Frank, uh, sure. and then we'll have to leave it then. Um, Bruce is, is asking, uh, where can I find um, risk categories for the various foods um, and the differences in FSMA requirements for each? Yeah, there is um, I've got a document here. It's, 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 uh, what I'll do, Simon, is that there is a, uh, a, a link to a, an FDA link that has more information on the, the risk categories, and that would be the the, the, the best place to start with. Uh, okay. We could we could somehow get it published uh, if you if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, well, what we do is uh, we've got a, on the forum we've got a topic for for this webinar, uh, so we'll paste all the questions and comments from that, and we'll, we can add links, uh, various uh, links of interest. Uh, Perfect. To yeah. That as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well. We've run a bit over, um, so I think what we'll do is we'll we'll wrap up now. Uh, sorry if we've missed any questions, but as I say, we will follow up on on all of them, so they'll post get posted on the IFSQM forum. So just uh, suffice to say, uh, thanks very much, Frank, on behalf of uh, all the attendees and from the uh, IFSQM. It's been great having you here today, uh, and we hope to see you again soon. Okay, my so, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay. Cheers,